what you're learning in lesson one is that we were in need of help even before the fall. If you look at Genesis uh, chapters one and two, before sin entered the picture, we needed wisdom from God in order to live life. Hebrews three, which is mentioned in lesson one, tells us that, that because of the reality of, of remaining sin, we're easily deceived, our hearts can become hard, and then it goes on to talk about how much we need other people in our lives reminding us of our need to grow in grace. And then there's another passage in Hebrews, it's more positive, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, talks about how we need to gather regularly and provoke one another to love and good deeds. And so Hebrews is capturing this basic need that all of us have for help. And what's encouraging in this lesson is that we're reminded that it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to admit that we need help, and we find that within the context of the body of Christ, that's where we can find help. Let me say this again, in case you forgot the last time we were here. We would love for you to leave today, and this is what we would love for you to say. I didn't learn anything new. I didn't learn anything new. Because we don't want to give the impression that somehow uh, Paul Tripp, Tim Lane, CCF, we have stumbled upon truth that the church hasn't been aware of for 2,000 years and all of a sudden here it is. And we don't want to form what, what we refer to as little Gnostic circles in your church, you know, the insiders who really get it and then the other people. Uh, we don't want to do that. What we hope you see in this material because it is, um, is emerging out of passages and texts of scripture, we hope that you were saying, I'm seeing old truths in new ways, in new ways that enable me to think practically about this ministry of reconciliation that I'm to be a part of in the lives of those that God puts in my path. And, and that's what we would like uh, for you to, to leave uh, focusing on. The other thing that we want you to understand is, again, just because you go through this training today and maybe just because you go through the curriculum, realize that this is kind of ministry 101, discipleship 101. Uh, last time, how does the gospel change and transform me? This time, now how am I to be used in someone else's life so that the gospel can flourish in their lives as well as they struggle with sin and suffering? Uh, but this is 101. It's basic stuff. And we don't want you leaving today thinking that all of a sudden you have become this case-wise expert counselor that is ready now to help anybody and everybody. You know, we're all at different stages in terms of maturity. We all have different gifts. We all have different skills. And so you want to, to factor that in as, as you think about this material. This is, this is a foundation for friendship building, for loving people well, for seeing redemptive friendships flourish, for bringing in natural and, and godly ways a sanctification agenda to the way that we relate to one another, that, that in an, an amazing way we are being used by God to, to help one another grow in grace and to become more and more like Christ, to reflect His image more clearly. And, and that's the point of, of this material. We want to see the body of Christ in general, we want to see the culture of the church grow so that everybody at some level is functioning in a much more skilled and wise and efficient and intelligent way in this work of redemption, this work of sanctification. You're going to have some people that are new at this and they're growing, and you're going to have people that have been doing this for years and they're more skilled and case-wise as they deal with not just uh, the basic struggles of life, but oftentimes those more complicated, even bizarre struggles that, that people can, can become enslaved to. Uh, what we are doing in Lessons 1 and 2 is fundamental for gospel application in the life of another. Let me, let me say this very, very clearly. Your understanding of what is essential about people and why they do the things they do will shape the way that you think about helping them. 
Let me be a little, a little bit more theological. Your ministry paradigm, your ministry philosophy will grow out of your biblical understanding of the person. Your anthropology. That's a, a category in systematic theology. A doctrine of the person. And, and your understanding of the person and what drives people and what leads them to do the things they do is going to naturally begin to shape the way you think about ministering to them. And in lessons one and two, what we are doing is we are, we are developing a biblical understanding of the person. Lesson one, a bit more general, as we think about creation, fall, redemption, Lesson two, we're beginning to burrow down and get a bit more specific as we look at the details of what makes people do what they do. So turn to uh, lesson one and you'll see three passages that we emphasize in this lesson. And they're connected nicely with the five passages that we use in lesson two. If you'll look in lesson one on page five, you have Genesis one, and then on page six, Genesis three, and then on page seven, Genesis, uh, Hebrews chapter three. Now, what do most people do when you turn to Genesis one and Genesis three? They glaze over. All right. Particularly if they've, if they've been in church, if they've been exposed to the Bible growing up. Genesis 1, Genesis 3, yeah, I've heard that stuff before, creation, fall. But what we are doing in this lesson is we are, I think, developing a practical theology of ministry. And we're using passages that are often used to develop a philosophical, theoretical worldview, creation, fall, redemption, and that's certainly appropriate, but we're using these passages to develop a practical ministry philosophy because Genesis 1 and 3 and Hebrews 3 begin to help us to understand why people do the things they do. Genesis 1. What does Genesis 1 teach us about who we are fundamentally as bearers of the image of God? Imago Dei. What, what's, what do we learn in Genesis 1? Well, Pre-fall, we learn, and if you look at Genesis 1, you don't have to turn there, but you look at 26, 27, 28. Pre-fall, you see this phrase, and God said. And God said. What does that tell us about who we are as human beings made in God's image? It tells us, first of all, that even before the reality of sin, even before the fall, we needed help outside of ourselves. You know, Adam and Eve are incurably worshipers, they're religious, and prior to the fall, they're in relationship with their creator, a proper relationship with their creator, but they're not only worshipers, they're interpreters, they're trying to make sense of their world, they're meaning makers, that is who we are fundamentally, and they can't make sense of the world that God has placed them in unless God speaks and helps them to interpret what is going on around them. And so the, the, the critical emphasis here of God's speaking to them prior to the fall. Here, here's something that's wonderfully liberating. It is a human thing. All right, it is a human thing to need help outside of myself. That is liberating. You know, what do we do? We spend all of our lives pretending that we don't need help. And Genesis 1 cuts through that and says, no, what it means to be human, and this is prior to the fall. It just gets accentuated after the fall. But prior to the fall, it is fundamentally human to need help outside of myself. And to admit that and to ask for help is an aspect of what it means to bear the image of God. I need help. I need help. I need help. That's what it means to be human. I need help outside of myself. I am insufficient unto myself to live life, 
to interpret life, to navigate all the challenges and difficulties of life without help outside of myself. And that's what it means to be in the image of God.